Welcome. Come right in. Pull up a chair and grab a coffee or a green juice or a hot cocoa because we have a lot to chat about today with my guest today, Kathleen Duffy, here on the Family Balancing Act, where we are restoring the heart of motherhood one conversation at a time. I'm Maureen, your host, certified in holistic and functional medicine health coach. I'm a mom, grandmother, wife, and CEO of my family's home operations just trying to stay in so-called balance. So the Family Balancing Act, episode 110, we talked all about things, stress around the holidays, and how we need a little hit of support to hang in there, right? So go to MaureenHuntley.com and get yourself your free ebook. The Healthy Holiday Starts with Mom, The Busy Guides to Surviving the Holidays Because Life Happens. Again, it's at Maureen Huntley, M-A-U-R-E-E-N-H-U-N-T-L-E-Y dot com. Uh, to dream, sleep, dream. Do you dream? We are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. William Shakespeare. Well, we all dream, it is said, and I firmly believe this. I do, although I know plenty of people in my life who'll tell me otherwise. Some are friends, some are clients, some are family members, and that's all they'll say about their story. They're sticking with it. They don't dream. <laughs> to quote Kathleen Duffy, our guest, from her fantastic book, Awaken to the wisdom of your dreams. When we are prepared to accept that our dreams give voice to the psyche seeking wholeness, that every soul longs to be reunited with its full potential, then doors can begin to open. So there you have it. Boy, <laughs> I know that I do dream. I love talking about it and having others talk about it, even when they don't want to. From the time our children could speak, I'd ask them when they woke up if they'd had any dreams, and I'd keep poking at them to get that answer and to tell me all about them. It was a great time to connect over a dream, a story, their feelings, and thoughts. When my kids would tell me all about their flying dreams, their sports dreams, and oh, and the middle child who dreamed about numbers chasing him. Can we say math class? Scary dreams, dreams that made them feel good, pee-pee dreams, or there were the flunking a test dream because they hadn't studied. Hmm, could that have been a premonition dream? I don't remember the particulars of so many of their dreams. I now wish I had written them all down or recorded them as they told their story. But life is so busy when you're living it, raising kids, working, and all that goes on. And as I say this, I'm declaring that as my grandchildren get older, I am so doing this. So hold me to it. So when I got married, and I still do it to the point where I'm totally annoying, it's kind of fun. I'll ask my husband if he had any dreams. And in the beginning of our relationship, he used to tell me, oh, he didn't dream. And he didn't dream that much if he did dream. And he didn't remember them. So there ended that story. Well, well, well. Years later, guess who dreams all the time? Yep, he does. And can't wait to tell me all about it, especially the weird and wonderful ones. He becomes so animated, which is not really his MO, for those who know him. But he can go on and on into huge dreams of past experiences, but with a twist, with a new ending or a new beginning or a completely different middle. I love it. So I did a little digging into the different types of dreams and the and the abundance of con, you know contradictory information was like overwhelming. It was so surprising for something that seems like it's just so natural. It's so straightforward. I believe humans have been dreaming since the beginning of the time, since we showed up on the planet or maybe prior, right? Well, there are five types of dreams or seven or not, or the last group, I found there were 17. Okay, then, 17 dreams. 
They're daydreams, they're lucid dreams, they're nightmares, they're false awakening dreams, they're reoccurring dreams, they're healing dreams, they're flying dreams, they're food dreams, they're falling dreams, they're epic dreams, they're dreams about teeth. Huh? Uh, their dreams about your childhood and their childhood dreams and their cathartic dreams, their amplifying dreams and past life dreams, psychological dreams and belief dreams. Wow, where do we begin? Well, one of my earliest childhood memories from when I was about, oh, three or four years old, I had a, a big dream. And yes, I still remember everything about it, every nuance of that dream still today. My dad was a very tall, handsome, strong, energetic man with a big, booming voice, like an announcer or a radio show host. Oh, the irony does not escape me. But in my dream, my father walked in the door and he was wearing a suit and he had a tie and he had a hat in one hand. And he looked like he had the world by the you know what's. He had a pipe in his mouth. And then this hand came out of nowhere. And it wasn't his hand. And I didn't see anyone. It was just an arm within a hand. And then it pulled the pipe right out of his mouth. And then the hand peeled off his lips. And that was the end of the dream. I remember being absolutely terrified. But at that time in my life, I had no words. I couldn't describe it. But I felt it. And I never forgot it. So who would do that? Why would I have that dream? Years later, in his 50s, he ended up with esophageal cancer and had half his voice box removed. And that big voice of his was silenced. I still to this day wonder if that was a premonition dream. And could I have stopped it? In the beginning was the dream. In the eternal night where no dawn broke, the dream deepened. Before anything ever was, it had to be dreamed. If we take nature as the greatest artist, then all presences in the world have emerged from her mind and imagination. We are children of the earth's dreaming. It's almost as though if nature is in a dream. And we are her children who have broken through the dawn into the time and place. Fashioned in the dreaming of the clay, we are always somehow haunted by that. We are unable to ever finally to decide what is dream and what is reality. Each day we live in what we call reality. Yet life seems so, seems to resemble a dream. We rush, th rush through our days in such stress and intensity as if we are here to stay. And the serious project of the world depended on us. We worry and grow anxious. We magnify the trivia until they become important enough to control our lives. Yet all the time, we have forgotten that we are but temporary sojourners on the surface of a strange planet spinning slowly in the infinite night of the cosmos. There is no definitive dividing line between reality and dream. What we consider real is often precariously dreamlike. Our grip on reality is tenuous. John O'Donohue, Eternal Echoes, Celtic Reflections on Our Yearning to Belong. My guest today, here on the Family Balancing Act, is my beautiful forever friend. We met when we were oh so young. And yes, boy, crazy. We connected at first because I was staying in the west of Ireland at my Aunt Martha's home. And I was driving her crazy, no doubt. And she knew I was desperate for a friend. And in steps Kathleen. We connected over tea, disco dancing, pub crawling, gossiping, but mostly over diving really deep into the meaning of life, faith, purpose, and dreams. Kathleen Duffy is just one of the most amazing, joyful people I've ever been blessed to know. She's a psychotherapist, dream analyst, and author of Awaken to the Wisdom of Your Dreams, an absolutely phenomenal book and resource. She is really well known in the field of dream work within psychotherapy, 
practice and regularly runs workshops. I'm going to hold her to this. She's got many coming up to share her own wisdom and experience on this fascinating topic. So welcome, welcome, <laughs> Kathleen Duffy. I am so honored to have you join us today. And I'm so honored you're my friend. Wow. Maureen, what can I say? I feel so emotional listening to you. Thank you for such an amazing introduction. I don't feel as if I could add anything to what you already know about dreams. Oh, I, my God. I don't. Been, I just did a light dive through, believe me. <laughs> oh, my God. I, I Yeah, I, I am passionate about dream work. And it's just so lovely to hear you recount our history. It feels like yesterday and yet all those years have gone by and it didn't matter how many years went by whenever we reconnected it was like just picking up the thread and now in recent years it's so lovely to see that there's more and more connection you were busy raising children I was busy searching and still searching and doing all kinds of research on the world of dreams but you know you said so many things I didn't take any notes I just tried to be present and listen because everything you said awakens in me the passion that I that I know you have and that I know I have I mean one of the first things you said was about people who say they don't dream and of course it's true we all dream all the time it's scientifically proven we actually all dream whenever we sleep and at workshops I have great fun with people who say they don't dream and um I give them the tips which are all in the book about how to remember the dream mm -hmm. and they come in the next day if we're doing a two-day workshop and it's like, oh my God, the awaken the dreams that are, you know, suddenly presenting themselves. And once people begin to pay attention to that realm, the psyche, the unconscious, the soul, I call it, I interchange the words, but it's it's a dream about you coming to you from your soul. And remember, it was the first um symbol was the first means of communication that we had. Man drew symbols in the cave before ever we had the written word. Mm -hmm. And because it's Christmas, I can't not acknowledge that um, Jesus' birth was announced. You know, there was a whole world of dream. Joseph was told not to be afraid to take Mary as his wife in a dream. She, he, she would have been stoned to death at that time, except for Joseph's dream. And there are so many uh, examples in the scripture where the dream is such an, an automatic part of the wisdom that they listen to both in the Old and the New Testament. So when I started, it's a long story. Go for it. We've I, got plenty of time, girl. And I love oh, this. <laughs> I don't know if I want to I don't want to impose the whole story on you, but I remember when I was searching, well, one of the many stages of searching, the search goes on, but I was getting so many um signs and symbols. And the point was where when I when I realized that there was messages coming to me from the dreams, I thought, oh, my God, where are these coming from? I want to know more about where they're coming from. And so the language of the dream was very symbolic. And without, you know, without the symbol, you said it in that reading from John, you know, and as you know, I've, I've known John. He used to he used to be terrified of his own dreams, despite what he said about them. But um, so the language of the dream is symbolic and the the earliest form of communication we had was symbol and so god spoke oh yeah when i when i started to look for where will i begin i had pages and pages of stuff on the floor i became a, an adult student if you like mm -hmm. um and i had all those pages of information on the floor i thought where will i begin and i had my famous blue book as a friend of mine used to call it my bible beside me and i opened it at random asking the spirit for guidance about where do i stay my function was to bring the unconscious content into consciousness. And I had to present um, a piece to my class when I was a student. And I thought, how am I going to do this? Because the nature of the conscious mind is the ego and it controls and the unconscious sort of spiritual content is often dismissed by that which is logical. And I thought, where will I start? How will I begin? And so I said a wee prayer. And I don't mind saying that because it's been so significant. And I opened the my Bible asking the spirit to show me where to begin. And it was from Job, which was Job 33. And it's in my book. And it was um, Yahweh speaks to us now one way, now another. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when man slumbers in his bed, he opens our ears and gives us instruction. So that was it. 
I was off. <laughs> <laughs> I got it. I got it. I got the message. <laughs> Where do I begin? That was my prayer. Where do I begin? And that was it. It's like, oh my God, while we're slumbering in our bed, he opens our ears in a dream and a vision of the night while we slumber. He opens our ears and gives us instruction. So I thought, well, that's enough for me. So I've been taking instruction ever since. And that's way back in the, well, that that message came in the in the middle eighties, but but long before that, as a child, I used to love that feeling of going to sleep where you'd see all those pictures and images. And I used to be so curious about what they were, but the minute I try and catch them, they were gone. Mm -hmm. So then I wouldn't wondered if they'd be there in the morning. And so that was the beginning of my relationship with the dreams. What were these pictures and what were those images and where were they coming from? And so the more I questioned it, the more these I took guidance. Yeah, I used to ask for guidance and I would always get a dream. I mean, I didn't know what to be doing with my life. I had turned down marriage a couple of times and that wasn't easy. No, it wasn't easy because that was what I was meant to be. I was meant to be a good wife and mother. Mm. I didn't become either, but I became mother in in other ways. Oh, but I remember the challenge to say, well, if I'm not meant to be married to either of these good men, what am I meant to be doing? And then the dreams came to help. And it was like, it was amazing because... The writing was on the wall. You know, when the writing is on the wall, it's inevitable, isn't it? So there was my name on the wall, Kathleen Duffy, number five, doing a course. I didn't know what course it was, but I was telling my friends that I was going doing a course <laughs> and they were laughing at me. said, oh, great. What course? I said, I don't know yet. <laughs> Here, <laughs> have another drink. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it used to be entertained. I was off every weekend doing a workshop on one thing or another. I was always searching and my friends were off at disco. A student. Yeah, and but but never a proper student until this. And uh, so I was intrigued by the course I was doing because in the course, I got in through a back door, not a front door. I got in through a back door and I was just saying, let's get on with it. I'm here. Let's start. I was eager. I was so eager to learn. And I thought, what is it about? And when I was telling my friends about it, you know, this number five business, I thought well, number five is I discovered the quintessence of life. And I thought, oh. I'll be doing a course about the quintessence, about the essence of life. And they said, oh, great. What is it? Where, which college is it in? <laughs> I'm saying, I don't know. How can you be doing a course if you don't know the college? So it, it ends up that I did psychosynthesis. And I wrote off to do psychosynthesis. Because a friend of mine, he was a psychologist. And he said, Kathleen, you should be doing psychosynthesis. And I said, what's that? He said, it's the way you live your life. Because I was telling him things that were happening. And he said, and I said, well, I can't. I, at this stage, I've made a commitment to work with with children with special needs. And I was very happy to make that commitment. And I, I promised them I'd be with them till they were 18. And the youngest was eight. So I had a mothering role for yes, all those it years. It was a big role. <laughs> it was. And I loved it. Mm -hmm. I loved it. And it was really significant. But during that time, I was questioning and questioning. And this is when I had this. And this is when I said to the psychologist, and he said, you know, I said, so in my dream that night, I'm doing the course. And I'm excited. But I'm also wondering, how will I do it? Because I promised the children I'd stay with them till they were 18. And all those courses were in Dublin and I'm in the West of Ireland. So I thought, how am I going to, how am I going to do it? And in the dream, somebody literally tapped me on the shoulder and said, it's okay, they'll be with you on the journey. And I thought, how can that be? So on the, on the Monday, this friend came with the paperwork. He said, this is what psychosynthesis is about. And he said, he said, you're born for it. He said, it's, it's the way you live. And so sure enough, I decided I would apply for it and I had to tell them why I thought I would be accepted, what books I had read, what made me think I'd be accepted. And when I got there on the Friday evening of a November bank holiday weekend, because the children were away during the November break and the course was on for the same 10 days that they were away. So I, it was, wow. They were on the and, and they said to me, Kathleen, you know, and I, I told them why why I was applying. Anyway, she gave me she gave me a folder and there it was. A green folder with Kathleen Duffy number five written on the outside of it. She knew nothing about my story about number five. And she said, Kathleen, you're in the you're in the room number five at the end of the corridor. So I'm thinking, where is this information coming from? I mean, how could this be happening? And yet in my soul, in my being, I knew that it was meant to be there. Mm -hmm. And so stage two of it was six months later in Dublin. 
And I was in Eckhart House and a guy called Michal O'Regan, he's dead since, Lord rest him, but he was very well recognized in Ireland as the, the founder of the uh, Psychosensitive School. So I was doing that stage and I was in the group on the Friday night sort of saying, I'd love to do more work on dreams, but there was no course in Ireland that I could do. And uh, they said, you'll have to go to Zurich. And I'm thinking, I can't go to Zurich. I've made a commitment to those children and I can't go to Zurich. But next morning at the coffee break upstairs, there's books from ceiling to floor, wall to wall. His, his whole house was filled with books. And instead of being at the coffee dock, taking addresses and emails or not in those days, it wasn't emails, it was phone numbers. Networking. Yeah. And that's what I would have been doing, but I wasn't. I was looking at the books and right at eye level on a line of books that was just so full. I took down the name of Strephon Kaplan Williams, the Sinai Dreamwork Manual in Berkeley, California. And I wrote it down. I sat on the floor, wrote it down. I thought, oh my God, that sounds interesting. I mean, it was thousands of books, but that's the one at eye level. The bell rang, we were downstairs for a group again. But the night before, when I was asking, you know, they gave, in those days, they gave um, a board. We had no, you know, it was before email. And the board that arrived in my lap to put the paper on says, still at number five. And I was thinking, wow, what's this about? And I asked, you know, that's when they told me there was no course outside of Zurich. So the woman at the reception on our way down the next morning, she said, Kathleen, you asked last night about a course on dreams. She said, here, this flyer, and she gave it to me. And it was Strephon Kaplan Williams, DreamWork Scenery Manual in Berkeley, California. I said, I've just written that address down upstairs. I literally wrote that down. I showed it to her. She said, here. So anyway, I ended up in Berkeley, California that summer doing DreamWork with Strephon Kaplan Williams. He's dead since, but it was amazing. And, you know, Maureen, it was like, it all happened so fast. I had no visa or passport or anything but I got it all sorted literally in time and while I was there they said you know was there some, I was the only one from Ireland and they were asking if there's somebody here from Ireland and of course I go on shock and he said Kathleen you're in cabin number five over there <laughs> so the point was that I said yes in advance of the confirmation and I think this is really important and it comes into the Moses story, you know, if you, if, you, if you go back to the scriptures where Moses said yes. I had said yes. And every time I did, I got con- it got confirmed. Never beforehand. So every time I said yes and took a leap of faith to follow this calling, let's call it, or vision or dream. Vocation. Because I said yes to the dream. And, you know, I was doing the course. I said, I'm doing it. I didn't know what it was. But here I am in Berkeley, California, and I'm in cabin number five. And... It was just so much stuff happening that was like that, like my friend had said at the time, up. constantly. And so it led from there then to psychotherapy training. And then, but it was like during the psychotherapy training, I had to give my presentation about how the unconscious world gets through to the conscious world. And that's when I got that message. He opens our ears and gives us instruction. So I'm thinking, where can you go after that? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, it's there. For all of us. And there are no exceptions. So what you said about, you know, your husband, we do dream. We don't always remember them, but scientifically we do dream all the time. Now, there are some people who are afraid to sleep and they develop insomnia. And it's because they're afraid of coping with the content of the unconscious while they're sleeping, because there's a lot of the shadow emerges while we sleep. And so people are afraid to sleep sometimes and they don't realize that Without the dream time, the the mental health breaks down and then they become insomniac and then they can't sleep and then there's ill health. Fascinating. I mean, yeah. I've never heard it explained like that because, I mean, and I know everybody, well, I can speak for myself. There are times I sleep really well some, and times when I'm stressed out and worried about things and not knowing how something's going to work out. That's often the time that I'm not sleeping. And that's when you're, yeah, that's when you most need because without the sleep, the psyche is not balanced. Here's what James Hollis, you know who James Hollis is? Oh, yes, you mentioned and it. Here's what he says. His messages, he says, now, you have to be patient with my reading of this because my eyesight is 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 not as well as it used to be. Um, it's while we might on some days prefer to be simply happy carrots, relieved of our urgencies, our anxieties, and the impossible desires. We also suffer greatly, and this is the line I love, we also suffer greatly 
when we are not living the life which the psyche wishes wishes us to live. And this is it. Such existential bad faith, it will always demand some payment in the body, in our relationships, in our disturbing dreams, or in the burden our children will carry for us. Isn't that powerful? If we don't, isn't it? And he says that that's the price we pay if we don't listen to the subconscious. If we don't examine our lives. I mean, it's it's the existential bad faith. It's it's in our nightmares. The fact that we don't sleep. It's in our. It's it's in the price our children pay. You know, it's like wow. That really made me sort of sit up and say, well, this this needs to be listened to. This needs well, to be honored. That we cart forward and mm. our children, grandchildren. It's all ancestral stuff. Yeah. And. Unless we carry it we really and the and the dream world is as you say it's 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 the perfect place to work this out it's the perfect place to get the answers it's the perfect place to get the guidance and to release and trust yes. and it becomes because the guidance comes from a place that is not our ego it's not our left brain it's not it's not our it's not our left brain it's our right brain it comes from that place and it's universal it is something that every culture has in common and a dream and a vision of the night, he opens our ears and gives us instruction. And when you think about it, and I just because it's Christmas and because of the whole business of Joseph being told not to be afraid and then being told in another dream to bypass Herod, you know, we, we kind of hear it read out every Christmas. We don't always think, wow, right. this is this is something that the, the dream was a means of communication from the other world to protect this world. And it, it's perfect. And, and actually, you know, Christmas or, n- or not, I mean, it, it, this is, should be remembered. This should be an affirmation as to going back to our dreams and, and really taking a look at them. I know for myself, I've had a lot of premonition dreams, but even this morning I had a wacky dream that's kind of, uh, and it was like a 10 second dream. Um, Go for it. Was a you know, in a deep sleep, I usually get up at four thirty in the morning every morning. This wow. morning, I've been carousing all weekend with friends, and um, I uh, I woke. I I was in the stream where all of a sudden I see a peanut shell, like a half a peanut shell, and it was flying and it was buzzing and flying. And I'm looking at it as it got closer to me. I wasn't afraid of it, but as I saw it get closer to me, um, there was a bee stuck in it. And it was trying to get out of it. And then it came over by my ear. And I and then and I woke up and I looked at the my clock and I was, oh my God, I'm late. You know, like I was already running late for the day by almost two hours. Um and, and my running late meant that I just didn't do some of the things I like to do for myself in the morning without anybody bothering me. But um yeah, it, it, but it's crazy how we get help from beyond. I that was an alarm clock. Yeah, <laughs> was for crazy, sure. But for but sure. But it's interesting that it's a peanut shell because mm-hmm. it's one of the analogies or symbols that I often talk about in relation to the, the shell is like necessary to protect the peanut for a period. It's like the womb is necessary for the baby for a period. But if the shell doesn't crack, what happens to the peanut? It disintegrates, dies. And it shrivels up and dies, yeah. So there's a whole focus there on the being as opposed to the doing, Maureen. The being. And here I am. And I just went with it. <laughs> <laughs> the bee, yeah. But the bee is so symbolic. I mean, it is it is such a busy bee as you are. Mm-hmm. So well, I'm sure if we were to explore I'm that. I'm getting bee messages. And I often think of my, my mother. I don't. The busy bee. Busy bee. And, and when I either see a butterfly or I see a bee, I go, oh, my mom's around, you know, I know because the butterfly, she would just flow and she was, but she also had a, a sharp sting at times like she would you know but she was busy but whenever I see a bee and my actually my couch here in my little office has bees on it so I love bees wow it is the, so the message if the bee and the thing about the dream work is you've got to give a voice what would the bee say to you if you could be the bee what would you be saying to Maureen um get up and do your meditations and pray <laughs> Is what I think the message, because that's my normal routine. But why do you think it was a, a peanut as opposed to any other nut? What's your last association with the peanut? 
Um, somebody gave me a gift over the weekend that was a bag of peanuts. Ah, uh, well, now shells. in shells. So, no, so what were you left with? Sorry, what were you left with? What's your association with that friend? Oh. And it might be the time to go there, but just for oh. you to be no, um, it, curious. It just it was a um, she it was a a nice gift. It was a nice. She was present. I was present. It was just a lovely exchange. I'd given her something. She gave me something. Um, it was a lovely exchange. So then, and this is not the place to go into it, but just for you to reflect on mm-hmm. why the dream chooses to go back to that peanut as opposed to any other of the gifts or any other right, nut right. or other fruit. Right. That's very interesting. I'll have to sit with that. I'll get back sit to with it. it. I, yeah. Because I'm really, it's, it's, um, Yeah. But the bee is definitely the busy side of yourself and it's a very, it, it provides honey and it's such a rich resource and it's an endangered species and it's such a, a powerful symbol. But it doesn't matter what I say about it. It's what your association is with the bee. Yeah. I, yeah. And I the, think years ago, I will go there because and even if she listens to it, she kind of knows this anyway. Um, years ago, when I first started out in, and I went back to school and I went back into nutrition and I went back to studying something I really love, which is nutrition and health and wellness, body, mind, spirit work, um, Reiki work and that. And I, um, I was, you know, very excited. And I remember telling her that. And, and um, I said, she goes, Oh, her answer to me was because I was starting to see clients. She goes, well, I could never hang a shingle outside my door and do that. And I took it upon myself to go, she's telling me that I can't do this. Mm. I felt really down about it for years. It just kind of trudging through it, but I kept like, I was always carrying that. Finally, I did ask her, I, or I, I said to her, I said, you know, you said that to, she didn't even remember saying that to me. She goes, no, no, I was, I was reflecting on myself. I can't, I can't do that. And I said, yeah. look how I took it, yeah. which is my stuff, sure. my own insecurity. So it's sure. funny that that pops in as I now get back into to working in a different way. Yeah. And a question to ask yourself always after a dream is when was the last encounter you had with whoever happens to be in your dream? So here we have horror from recent times and the nuts. So there's a very significant statement there. But the the, the thing that wasn't in reality is the bee. So the bee is, is the aspect of you that, you know, that is so precious to the earth because the, without the bee, we don't, we don't survive mm-hmm. as humans. Right. So it has a really, you know, it's an endangered species. Loaded. This is loaded a lot. Yes. Of, yeah. Oh, it's fascinating. Yeah. I yeah. love. I just, you work with so many, many, many people, and do you find that they're, you know, the the dream language is different for everyone, or is there, there's just a main thread? Oh, Maureen, like, the dream, the dream is so direct. It gets us away from the ego and the logic, and it it's so direct as a means of communication. It is so, I never cease to be fascinated and intrigued by the wisdom, even in the dream, the bee coming into your dream. I mean, there's a whole focus on the, on just on the, on the, the symbol of the bee, but it could have been any, it could have been a wasp, but it wasn't. It was a bee. It could have been a fly. It could have been a butterfly. It was a bee. So you have to be really curious. One of my dreams was um, many years ago, and this one is in the book as well, where I put on one of the white Max that I had, you know, the way we have many clothes and you wonder why would one show up in your dream and not another. So this one that shows up in my dream is a white Macintosh that I had many years earlier. And I think, why am I wearing it? And in the dream, I put my hand in the pocket and I take out a, a silver spoon. And of course, the silver spoon is the symbol for um, privilege. So I'm thinking, whoa, what's the white Mac about? Of all the coats I ever had. And of course, what do we know about the white Mac? You're probably... You may or may not remember who used to wear a white Macintosh. But who did we grow up with on the television that wore a white Macintosh? Oh well, it would be like um, uh, I like uh, Kennedy's wife, or um, uh, no, I don't okay, know. Okay, no, it's great. It's great that you don't know because I didn't know either. But I started being and when I when I have great fun in the groups. This because who wore the white Mac Colombo? Oh God. Okay. <laughs> yes, the big. Yes, the white man. Now, and I'm thinking, why am I wearing Columbus coat? And what? And 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 the the spoon of silver spoon is privilege. And I'm finding it in my pocket. So I'm thinking, 
wow, what? And I started to think because I grew up with Colombo, who was the one of the first television programs yeah, we worked with as a family. Yeah, and trying to, yeah. And well, the private yeah. investigator. So, and but the thing about it is, he was always, <laughs> you know, and this is what my work is. The dream is, it's like dream work is private investigating. It's mm-hmm. investigating into your private life. And I, the privilege was so, because he had, the, he had the privilege of going into people's homes and hearts. They always trusted him. And nothing was too small to be investigated. When he went into their homes in that series, every single detail was worth exploring when he was trying to find the truth mm-hmm. of who did the murder or whatever, who did it. So it was really fascinating. And I remember when, when I had the dream, I thought, oh, well, I really do have the privilege of people opening up their hearts and souls to me through dream work. And that was the privilege of the Silver Spoon. And when I realized the other thing about Colombo, was what happened when the truth was revealed? When he would find the truth, what would begin to happen? It was only then that healing could begin to happen. Right. There was right. never any healing in the story until the truth was revealed. So the dream work has the same function. Once the truth is revealed through following the signs and sequences and details, just like he did, and it's like, oh my God, that's my work. And it became so significant, the privilege, and it continues to be a huge privilege. But I always remember thinking that he had the privilege of trust. People trusted him and, and he always found the truth yeah. in the end in his own in his own way. Now I want to watch Columbo again because I for, kind of forgot. You know, I remember he was like this gruff guy just walking around going, you know, and, and sneaky, like not sneaky, but clever, just so clever at like yeah. gaining trust and then digging in. That's it. <laughs> yeah. And, and I mean, finding the truth. And mm-hmm. only when he found the truth could the healing process begin. Yeah. And, you know, the expression, the truth shall set you free. It was only when the truth was revealed that the person could begin to move on from the crime and start their healing process. And I believe that dream has the very same function for all of us. And that, and that's my work, to be the private investigator into oh, the interest of dream. Oh, there, I had lost you for a second. Sorry. But that that is true. It's like the, the dream is the answer. Yeah. The, it's, well, it's, it, it, gives, it gives the clues, just like... Mm-hmm. You know, and it was that's a long time ago, but I always remember being so curious. And so now when I work with dreams, I say, put on your Colombo hat and get the whole group to put on the Colombo hat and be curious because the wisdom, the answers are all there. If we just have eyes to see and ears to hear. Wow. Can I, I ask you, was there is there one dream out of clients or that that you would feel confident or of your own or of even mine or whatever that stands out to you that was pretty remarkable your one is the first one that comes to mind the one you had about your mother before she died that one to me is often one that i am drawn to wow and i had the privilege of you sharing it with it with me and it's i think it's in the book isn't it it is in the book you did yes you you, and i was so honored i asked your permission because uh, to me that was just one of many 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 yeah you got captures over a hundred dreams in that book i think or a hundred yeah yeah but I, I, I'm never tired of hearing that dream that you had and how powerful it was. So if you don't mind yeah, no, sharing I'll, with us I'll again. Tell that our listeners, um, you know, and, and of course now it's, it's, it's fading a bit. So I, I don't know if I'll, I'll, you know, remember it fully, but I just, um, I had a dream uh, two years before my mother passed away and it mm. was such that she, you know, we were, um, she just had a massive heart attack. Um, they were able to pull her back and, uh, and they kind of said, no, you know, like she would, she was going to go. And I was, and I was absolutely wrought with that. And the dream I had was, um, I saw this beautiful building and it was just, it had prisms. It was just light shining, like crystals shining all over it and the and the light would move in and out and I was mesmerized by it and and I looked down in the dream and my mother was sitting in a wheelchair now my mother never was in a wheelchair unless she would had been sick and um and actually this was prior to my mother going into the hospital and having Mm. you know having this massive heart attack so, so to see her in a wheelchair I mean she would be like well, mm. as well but never like ongoing and I thought oh that's strange and I remember 
he was a very old wheelchair with a very thick handle. See, those people, details are really important. This yeah. is where Colombo would have a field day with you. <laughs> I know. And I remember all this now as we were talking about. And the yeah. handle was worn and old and it was heavy and it was and it was just like hard to roll. So I started to roll it into the building and we get to the um the elevator and I'm looking at all the lights and the and how the lights are zinging around and and I push the button to go on the ele- into the elevator and as I push her in there and close the doors and um and the elevator starts to go up and it it's just the lights again they kept going and I and I looked at her and she's you know, she looked almost like a child going are we there yet are we there yet are they excited felt? and then as we got out the doors opened up and I pushed her out. And I, I was like, where are we? It was, it felt so wonderful and comforting and just full of joy. And I look across the, 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 um, the hall or the, you know, this giant foyer area that's mm. on top and there's a conference room. And I start going towards the conference room and the conference room. And I realized in the conference room, there's this big round table. Wow. Uh. And that, and as I, I get the shivers when I remember this piece. And as I open the door and I start, to, I just felt compelled to go in. But as I opened the door, I noticed there were twelve seats around the table. And then as I continued to move in, I look up again, and at the table are eleven seats are filled. Wow. And I thought immediately. I thought for a moment, is this like the Last Supper or something? Mm. You know. And then kind of. But um, and then I realized those were all of my mother's brothers and sisters sitting at the table. And Martha, wow. the one I mentioned at the beginning of our, the show today, the one who I'd always go and stay with, was standing on one side and her brother, John, who she was very close to, was on the other side. And she starts to um, pull, try to pull the chair back in front of her so she can get into it. And I stop her and I go, no. Because I knew something was up. You know, no, no. And she and she kept fighting me and fighting me and fighting me. And my aunt next to me says to me, um, uh, yes, something like that, or or yes, she, she has to go. This is this is her time. She wasn't saying that. I can't remember mm. how it, it was. I have to read your book again. But you weren't ready. You weren't ready. I was not ready. And, and I you kept... said no. And I remember you said no, no. And you took her hand off the chair. And then I Martha her said, off the chair. okay, two more years. Right. She said, she goes, and she looked very disappointed. And I looked over at my Uncle John and he was like, I don't know what to say. <laughs> like a guy would. And then, and she goes, I'll give you two more years. And, and I, and I was like, fine. I pulled her off and I, and, and she put her back in the chair and I like, left and then the dream ended and I woke up and I thought god that's just so strange yeah. and then like a couple of days later she had the massive heart attack which was a premonition dream like the one you had about your dad when you were a child mm-hmm. it's amazing how your soul never gives up on giving never you the links up and giving us information and then no lo and behold when she did pass away it was two, it was two years of two years and you had important work to do with her in the meantime oh boy Yes. Which only you we could have done. Stories, right. We had stories that we needed to t- put to yeah. settle. Things needed to be settled. And But amazing. Yeah. Amazing. You're in a different state and all this is coming. And that was one of the things that made me sit up straight and listen to my dreams. In 1984, I was in India traveling around with a cousin who was doing some work with Mother Teresa. And anyway, I, it wasn't what I, I wasn't at all prepared for the shock to my system that India was. So we went on a train on the fifth week. And we didn't have a, a an address. Originally, it was Bombay and Calcutta. But on the fifth week, we went traveling on a train up to New Delhi and wherever. We didn't know where we'd be staying. But for five nights in a row, those five nights, I dreamt that there was a group of people standing outside my parents' house, my father's house. I didn't say my parents' house, even though they were both in it. And neither of them were sick. And I never had any reason to be concerned about either of them. So just like you, it's like the premonition. So in on five nights in a row, the group were gathered. And, you know, in Ireland, the west of Ireland, when there's people gathered outside the family home, what's the? it's usually a funeral. So I'm thinking, oh, my God, he could be dead and buried in three days and they wouldn't know where to find me. We had no mobile phones. It was 1984. Mm, yeah. And so I'm thinking, oh, my God, how? So 
when I came back to Bombay, there was a letter from my mother. And of course, it was full of all kinds of news. But there was nothing about my father. I'm thinking, she wrote that letter before I had the dreams. And I was coming back a week later. When I got in as far as Dublin, um, you know, my cousin picked me up at the airport. And it was like, we have something to tell you. And I just said, what happened to my father? And he said, how did you know? And so for the five nights that I was having the dreams, I'm on the train. There's no fixed abode. I don't know where they don't know where to find me. And those are the five nights my father had a heart attack and was in intensive care. Now, he had never any heart issues before that. He never was in hospital before that. So I'm thinking, where is this information coming from? How is it reaching me Mm. right the way across the world? And that same cousin that I was with, like, you know her, Trezeva. And uh, the point was, before that, I had a dream. I was in Florida some years earlier, and I dreamt that I was walking behind a coffin with her. She's the only one I recognized. And I thought, oh, somebody young is dead. It was all young people. And I thought somebody young is dead. And you know, when you're on holidays and you have a dream, they say, what's the usual words? It's only a dream. Forget it. Mm -hmm. You read. So I said, no, it was. So when I came back, of course, I asked how was Eva and Declan and there was silence in the car. And I said, Declan is dead, isn't he? And they said, how did you know? And I said, Declan was killed in a motorbike accident in Scotland on the day that I'm having the dream in Florida. So the dreams were coming to me from Florida and from India. And they're accurate. And I'm thinking, how can this be? They're not something I had suppressed from the past, which and we, we don't have enough time today, but the, the function of the dream is to bring stuff into consciousness that we have suppressed. But these weren't suppressed dreams. These are happening. Synchronous. Synchronicity, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was in the now. And so both of them were happening as I was dreaming. And that made me think, I want to know more about how this information, telepathic relationship, or really significant information is reaching me. And both of them were really accurate. Exactly at the time I'm dreaming in Florida, he's being killed in Scotland. And exactly as I'm dreaming five nights in India without an address, without a phone number, my father's having intensive care. So that made me really take it further. The miracle of of our communication skills. But you know, Maureen, they say that in the other realm, the the communication skills is telepathic, that we don't need words. But this is probably... You know, there's part of me that, well, I do believe that once we exit and let go of the skin jackets. Yeah, jackets, exactly. And and we move through into the next realm, that that's how we communicate. Maybe that's, you know, maybe that's the communication. And But do you see, that's, and it's such an ancient means of communication. I mean, imagine it was the official means of communication mm-hmm. to announce the birth of Jesus and that it was the means of communication between God and man. And how did, you know, how did the wise men find out? You know, like, it wasn't like they were in, in and the shepherds and other, you know, they, they were all getting this telepathic guidance. information. They were getting guidance and they followed the star. So I do believe we need to follow the inner guidance and the guidance is coming. I just think it's amazing. It's coming to us, through us, for us, from our soul. And if we ask, we'll receive. It's just, it never ceases to amaze me that if you want, and you know the old wisdom, and I have tons of notes taken, which of course I'm not referring to any of them now because I started chatting with you. But the old the old um, wisdom always was, you probably heard it as well. You probably heard our Martha say it. Before you'd make a decision, you'd sleep on it. Mm-hmm. Oh, gosh. Yeah. I do sleep that today. Why? I yeah. do that sleep on it. And if I do, you know, this wordle thing that's on now, you know, you oh, word. no, everybody's addicted to it. They're all well, I love it. And if I can't, if I'm tired at night and I try and do it, if it's after 12 o'clock and I'm not asleep, oh, I'll do the wordle. And then I'm half asleep. And then I said, you know what? I wake up in the morning and it's so clear. I get mm-hmm. it usually. And I remember the wisdom, sleep on it, because it's more balanced. What you bring to it is more balanced, whereas it's only the left brain that's trying to figure it out otherwise. But if you go asleep, the unconscious wisdom, the psych, the right brain can bring the balance. And so the function of the dream ultimately is to bring balance to our lives. And it's to reveal to us what the conscious mind is threatened by. And it's it's just now you have me started. I could go for another hour. <laughs> We're gonna. I'm gonna have you back on. So definitely. And also, I have a. a I have a, a proposition for you, which I'll bring up. But um, I, I just wanted to mention also that um, that that connecting to our 
dreams is is the way forward, especially in the the time we're in in the world now, moving from 3D into 5D. Absolutely. Um, we're letting go of old ways, old thinking. Um, we're letting go of what doesn't serve us anymore. Absolutely. People are wondering why they're so out of sorts and why systems. Yes, we're not listening crumbling. inwardly. And and yes, so we're being called to do that, whether kicking, screaming, whatever. Yeah, we so. resist change. But you know what's really interesting that you started out reading and I didn't know you were going to do that. You read that beautiful piece from John O'Donoghue, Lord Reston, and, you know, it's coming up to his anniversary. But I remember that it was New Year's Eve and his birthday was a New Year's Day. And in my dream, I dreamt about him. And in the dream, I said to him, oh, my God, I said, you look terrible. I said, what happened to you? You look like you had a heart attack or a stroke. And three days later, of course, I got the awful sad news he was gone. And it was never revealed if it was a heart attack or a stroke. But it was right. And, and I was wondering, I was really wondering, and since you read his piece, you've activated this in me, like, where did that information come from? I couldn't have known. And then on his month's, the evening of his month's mind, this is really significant because when both my parents died, I had a visit from them in the other world. I had a dream that my father was being greeted by all his dead siblings, just like you saw all Martha's siblings around the table. And uh, my father's siblings welcomed him and said, Tommy, you know, you're welcome. We didn't have long to wait for you. So it really gave me ease on the eve of his month's mind. And the month's mind in our Irish tradition is about, um, you know, the soul's journey mm -hmm. to, to arriving. And there's a month allowed. And that's why we have the lovely tradition of the month's mind. And when it was my mother's month's mind, she drove. She never drove a car. But in my dream, she was now empowered and she was driving. Mm -hmm. We were all standing outside the cottage that she loved. She loved her home. She wasn't coming in. She drove down past and she went around a corner and she told me, she was going back home to where she came from. And it was such a relief. Oh. And in the, that day, we all gathered in her cottage. We all got this. It was, it was a really cool. She died on the first of, uh, no, the end of January. The very, This was the first of February. And uh, we all got this really strong scent. And we all went, who's got the lovely perfume? Now, at least six of us got the smell. And there was like, 30 of us in the house Who, who's wearing the new perfume and then it was the smell of the roses <laughs> nobody was wearing new perfume it was one of those symbols that you get the smell the right. scent of the roses from the heaven and then when it was John's month's mind it was really interesting because I was dreaming that I saw him in his corpse body reflecting and he was looking in the mirror but in the mirror he was still in the coffin and he, and he could see that I could see him. I was looking through an opening like a letterbox window, but my opening to John was always through his dreams. And so when I looked at him, he looked at me and I said, remember me when you get there. And he was very impatient. Like, can't you see I'm not there? And he said, father and spirit. Now, he didn't say father, son and spirit. The son is the only part who came to earth. But he was not. He wasn't. He was self-reflecting, looking in the mirror. And I was told to sit down and watch a movie that was going to be about the latter part of his life. And I was, okay. And I sat down and watched it. And I was given the title of the movie. Now, at that time, Maureen, the last thing I was looking for was what movies was on. Believe me, I was not interested in movies. I was devastated. And sure enough, the title of the movie was, it was three words, and then there was the word blood. So I, I just wrote down dot, 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 blood. I'm thinking, oh, what? I don't know any movie. But the word. So I was asking all my movie friends, what do they know? And one friend came that week and I said, you watch movies, I said. It was literally, literally before his month's mind. And I said, what movie has three words before the word blood? There will be blood. And he said, Kathleen, it's coming out next Friday. He said, my favorite actor is in it, Daniel Day-Lewis. And it's a called There Will Be Blood. I said, what is it about? And it's about a radical young preacher, which John was. Mm -hmm. a rad and what was it about? The battle between matter and spirit. I think I need to watch that again. Oh, my God. The battle between matter and spirit. And I was told it was about the latter part of his life. Knowing him as well as I did, it was about the latter part of his life. That is matter. remarkable. It was an incredible battle between matter and spirit. But so I and the, all those kinds of dreams made me sort of say, oh, my God, I am being given information that my conscious mind could never have known. 
or handle or handle at the at, you know if you had gotten that immediately you would you'd be like just your ego would step in and go get it out of here it's gone exactly exactly but it was so accurate i'm thinking again i couldn't have known i wasn't watching movies i was distraught but there was no way that i would have known consciously the name of the movie and then it was coming out the following week and i was like oh my god so yeah there are there's guidance there's no doubt there's guidance as you were one told me, I mean, that dream of you with your mom, and I mean, you had another one when your dad was passing. I, and I know that you're one of the converted. But it's lovely to talk with somebody who is kind of um, excited as I am about the guidance that's available to us. It, I love it. And I just give me more. And there's so many times that I, I have these dreams weekly or, and they're not as profound but they'll be like the bee in the, in the, you know, but it's in your like, ear, in my ear. It. And it's in your ear. Up, knowing that, yes. It's not in front of your eyes. It's in your ear. So you need to hear, you need to hear the message. Right. It just, and maybe, maybe the busy bee needs a bit of protection, a bit of help. Well, because Yes. Yes. Well, we'll talk later because now, we're, <laughs> but I, I just it, absolutely love having you on. You are. A, Thank you freaking amazing and i um my my um hope is that we can actually um create a little something together on on um, thank you maureen doing, thank you so much I, workshop i as the new year begins i think it would be great to do a zoom work, workshop and um and just you know help to guide people towards the listening to this this inner wisdom through dream inner wisdom I, I, and you know what? I totally forgot we were on a program. I was just chatting to you as my friend. And so I don't know. A lot of it may need to be left out and that's okay. But I just want you to know that you got me. You got my, my juices well, you got going. me going too. And I kind of yeah. forgot too. I was just like, that. and that's how it's supposed to be here at the Family Balancing Act. Because we are about just hanging out, having a cup of coffee, having a conversation and enlightening each other and holding space and love and in the crazy times that yeah. I say mothers, but it's really all of us. And we all. Come but, you know, that's life. the word balance really comes into play in my work. The function of the dream is to bring balance to our lives. So I and love it, the way you use the word balance. It brings the balance between the unconscious and the conscious. And it's, and it's not about going to the extremes. Like it's this. about the balance between the two extremes. Mm -hmm. So it's and a wonderful word. It's only for a moment. Hmm. It's only a moment because we go back into, you know, not being in balance or something. Sometimes you slide the other way, but. It, I, I do love that word, even, even though I whine about it sometimes on the show. No, well, it's you know, it's, it's perfect that. word. It's exactly what I say the function of the dream is. It brings balance to our lives. So, um, again, Kathleen, where Thank can you. everybody find your book? <clears throat> oh, it's well, I've sold out the ones I published, 2,000 copies, and they all sold out. So it's on Amazon. That's all I know is that it's on Amazon. It can be found on Amazon. And it's called uh, Awaken to the Awaken. Well, well I Awaken think the, to the wisdom of your dreams is the name of the book. Yes. And the, 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 the website, I think, is Awaken to Our Dreams. Um, the website is Awaken to www Awaken to Our Dreams, I think, is a website or something to that effect. It's so long yeah, since I've used Google, it. I like Google, Google Kathleen yeah. Duffy, psychotherapist. I, Awaken to the wisdom of your dreams book. Yeah, you'll find it. But I, I know that your all of your workshops always sell out. You always do them in person. But I'm, you, I'm, I'm setting the challenge in front of you and I'm here and I want to help you do this is to do it on Zoom. And um and I'm, I'm as you honored. know, I've had resistance. We all resist change and yes, we live in a time of change, don't we? We are in constant change. So if you don't mind hanging here for a minute, I'm just going to kind of close sure. the show for a moment just to let our sure. listeners know what, you know, what's going on. And, and what I do is um, if we can just take a about a moment for some, you know, mom zen, some meditating moment Wonderful. for all of us. <laughs> so just Wonderful. Take, everybody take your, you know, if, you, if you're driving, don't do this. But if you can, you know, put your hand on your heart and just take in a deep breath. Close your eyes. And as you take in a deep breath, just feel your heartbeat and slowly release it. And again, another deep breath in all the way down into your gut. 
and release it. And one more time, another deep breath in, all the way down, all the way down to your buttocks. And hold it and release. And as you slowly come back, know that you are beautiful, beautiful, beautiful inside out. Your energy is all around you. Your heart keeps time for you. So with that, I want to thank everyone who's joined us today. And if you're joining us on our podcast, which you can find us on Apple, Spotify, Pandora, uh, iHeartRadio. Oh, there's so many. So go to www.maureenhuntley.com and you can find them there. You can find them at CTR, um, Contact Talk Radio Network, which I'm so grateful for them and for my producer, Cameron. So God bless. Have a wonderful day and take a deep breath and know that you're not alone here on the Family Balancing Act.